Okay, good evening. Like I said before, my name is Maria Moreno, and uh, my background is pretty rich in education. I am a lifelong student. I have attended the University of Michigan, where I got my Bachelor of Science in Graphic Design. I attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I got my BFA in Visual Communications, which was a bridge between fi fine arts and graphic design. I've also attended the Art Institute of California, San Diego, with another Bachelor of Science in Graphic Design, and that was focused more on technology. And also the Academy of Art University of San Francisco, which completely bridges fine arts and graphic design technology together. Now today we're talking about, is technology changing art and design? And really, what we see is a change in the art forms that are coming about these days. More people are doing digital artwork versus traditional artwork, such as paintings and sculpture. You even see this in the universities. You'll see a dramatic rise in students joining classes like graphic design and industrial design, and not as many students joining classes such as jewelry designers. A lot of parents are a little skeptical about their children going to art school, so they kind of default to these design programs in order to make their parents happy a lot of times. Now, it's talking about technology changing design. The way graphic design looks is intimately related to technology because in this time that we're in now, the technology is the means by which we produce our work. So you can see a few examples here of some tool, previous tools of the trade, typewriter spool, um, electroset, some tea, um, some tea rulers and uh, some pica rulers that were used before as well, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. When I first started going to college at the University of Michigan, technology was already there to be a graphic designer, but the school wasn't really up to par with having students go into the technology right away. So out of my four-year degree, only my fourth year of college was on the computer studying graphic design. The first three years was doing everything by hand. Now, the importance of doing things by hand. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Paula Scher, but she's a very famous graphic designer. I was always taught at different universities to always start your design process by hand because there's nothing that the computer can do that can intimately relate what is going on in your mind at this point with technology. So, with this example of Paula Scher's logo, what we see is a napkin drawing that she made during a meeting with Citi to decide on what their new logo was going to be. She made it very quickly while in the conversation and then later developed it, which you can see in, this, in the slide right, or the image right next to it, and then the final design at the bottom. Now this is just a reminder that nothing beats what you can do by hand. And like I said before, the technology is there, but it's more of a conduit to express your ideas rather than the means to an end. And also, another thing that, that I learned throughout my studies and that I practice in my own work is to always start by hand, which is stated earlier. But what I mean by hand is to learn to, be, to discipline yourself. When I begin a logo design, I start off with at least 50 original, independently thought out ideas for a logo design, hand drawn, no computer, which sounds like a lot of work, and it is. But in order to flesh out the ideas that you have, you really need to push yourself and be disciplined to get every cliche, every you know, um, first thought that comes to your mind out is to put it on paper. Not necessarily on the computer, but by hand. Because it's the only real way that as soon as you think it, you can put it down. On a computer, you're missing the seconds between what you're thinking and figuring out how you're going to put it on the computer, and you're going to lose the idea. Now, some forgotten tools of graphic design we can see here, which some of them were before my time, but airbrushing used to be a very big, big deal before. And even in the mid-'80s, airbrush t-shirts were all the rage. And if you could airbrush, you were just way cool. Um, there was also phototyping drawlet pens, which are equivalent to a calligraphy pen. But even calligraphy. The art of calligraphy is a lost art these days. Most of the time, if you want to learn calligraphy, you learn it from a box, not necessarily from a person who is practicing calligraphy. These other examples, you can see the drawing stand, which was a very much needed tool back in the day with graphic designers because we did everything by hand. You can see um, also we have the spectra setter, which was you know, the closest thing to a virtual drawing board back in the day. 
But we see here, like these tools, you still have to use a lot of your physical self in order to use them. And now we've gotten to the point with technology that all we're doing is using our mouse most of the times, or our tablet if we have one. Now, going switching all the way over to art, I have two quotes here, one from the president of RISB, which is the Rhode Island School of Design, and the other one by Mark, Martha Burksale. Now, John Maida states, I think that computers and the advancements of computers hasn't changed art very much. It's enabled more to happen. And I have to agree with them here in the sense that it's enabled more to happen, but the thing that, that is enabling, the thing that's happening more is that more and more art is being produced because it can be done rather quickly now because of the advancements of technology. But if we go down to the second quote where, where Martha is stating, no matter how we use the technology, the human mind will always be at the forefront. It will always be at the center of the art. So even though the medium is changing with digital painting, digital photography, you still have the human mind and the human eye looking towards what they're creating. And on top of that, the way technology has also impacted art is in past artworks. Now we have technology that is enabling uh, restores to be able to, in simple terms, x-ray a painting and find the, the last set of drawings that an artist had before he laid the final painting artwork on the canvas. Or we've, been a, we've been a, even able to find some of the artist's thumbprints stuck into the paint now because of technology. The advancement of technology is also helping us be able to restore the art better. Having better scans of the artwork gives us better detail, being able to restore it more and more accurately over time. Forgotten tools of the art trade, I mean, 60 art lessons for $1.95, I mean, I couldn't beat that. I mean, if that was still around, I wouldn't have student loans. But uh, here you had the Van Dyke drawing pencil, you know, stating that you know, the other classic artists were born too soon. They didn't have the advanced, advanced technology of this drawing pencil. Then we have more pencils in the pantograph. I remember seeing that in my great-grandmother's attic, and I had no idea what it was. But apparently you can redraw a drawing, or draw it twice. Um, I didn't know how to work it, so I just left it in her attic. Um, now, I just want to wrap up with, I don't know if any of you are familiar with John Cage, but he set out a long time ago some rules and hints for students and teachers. There's actually 10 rules and about eight hints that he gives. I've only listed five here. If you want to read the rest of them, email me. I'll have my email on the next slide, and I will send you the rest of them. But I just, because this is mostly students, I want to remind you of these rules because they've helped me over the years. And one of them is find a place to trust and try trusting it for a while. The general rule as a student is to pull everything out of your teacher and everything out of your fellow students. Pick everybody's brains. Ask them questions. No question is a dumb question. We've heard that since we were in first grade, and it still holds true. And then as a teacher, pull everything out of your students. Push them. I hated my teachers that pushed me while I was in the class. But once I was done with that class, I was so appreciative of that teacher that drove me to be better than what I thought I could be. Consider everything to be an experiment and be self-disciplined, as I stated earlier. Self-discipline is a must, especially if you're going to be an entrepreneur. Nobody is there telling you that you have to work the clock or that it's break time or anything like that. So you need to learn self-discipline and now is the best time to learn it while you're in school. So that way when you go out in the world, you are already one step ahead of most other people. And here's my contact information. Like I said, my company is Elephant Trunk Design. We've been in business over 10 years now. My phone number is there and as I stated before, if you wanna shoot me an email about any questions or anything, any concerns, uh, my email is there as well, and if you want the rest of John Cage's rules and hints, I will email them out to you. Okay. Yes, I just moved to the valley in January. Yes, so I'm very fresh to the valley um, and the weather. Uh, but, um, but I've been able to gain some very nice clients here in the valley that are, some of them are open to new technology and some of them are not. So it's 
quite interesting. It's been my first experience in in my company to work with people who aren't as interested in advancing techno their business in technology. Yes. Uh, yeah, can you repeat the question? Oh, you want me to repeat the question? <laughs> okay. Um, how do I make? How do I meet new clients or make new clients? Either through networking or social media. It's actually through both. My uh, the meat and bones of what I do is majorly is mostly networking, because for what I do, you have to create a relationship with your client. And if you're just working over the computer, like, hey, I want to hire you for this or that, you don't really get a feel for the client, nor do they get a feel for me either. So I really, really push networking a lot. It helps to speak to your client directly, because then they can also see that you are knowledgeable about what you're doing, rather than sending an email that, even with technology, being able to spell check, there are times where I've sent emails that have really bad spelling, and it just doesn't look good. And nothing can be a face-to-face -face meeting with the client. So for me personally, I do a lot of networking, and then I have a lot of referrals through the clients that I have. So where were you working for again? Uh, I've been running my company over 10 years now. But prior to that, I worked with uh, Barton Beers, which is the major importer of imported beers. Mm -hmm. But I've physically located before that. I've been in Virginia Beach. I've lived in Boston, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland. <laughs> um, there's a few more smaller cities in there, but uh, I love to travel. I love uh, immersing myself in different cultures within the U.S., so I have a broad range of different cultures. Yes, yes. Here, people are more after just a reprint of what they already have. Mostly, my clients on the West Coast are all, are usually wanting something different. Like every couple of years, they're like, "I need to redo my logo. I need to redo my company colors," and they're all about wanting to be a little bit more trendier. Here, it's very traditional, which is fine. It's just a different, you know, different cultural attitude. On the East Coast, it's very conservative. You won't see a lot of bright colors. You'll see a lot of which is fits in with the East Coast, but you see a lot of autumn colors in design out there. But the East, the West Coast is where you're going to see the most experiments with color and uh, design. And uh, the Midwest is pretty good. They're they're getting up there as far as being a little bit trendier. Minneapolis is becoming a great design hub, actually, which is surprising for the Midwest. <laughs> but yeah. Yes, I do have a high customer retention rate. Most of my customers, I have some that have been customers e e over 10 years, actually, even before I branched off to my own company when I was freelancing. But yes, most of my customers I've had minimum five years. Oh.